This episode goes out to Lee from Indiana. Hi there, Megan Robinson here. Welcome to the 15th episode of the Nightblade Epic Podcast. We've got some really big news for you today. We've just released our latest audiobook. It's called The Alchemist's Touch, and it's the first book in the Academy Journal series. A different story from the Nightblade Epic, but still set in the world of Underrealm. The Alchemist's Touch tells the story of Eben of the Family Drayden as he begins his magical training at the Academy for Wizards, the same academy where Zane from the Nightblade Epic learned to use his magic. And there are many more links between the series and between Eben's story and Lauren's. In fact, actually, you know what? I can't say much more without spoiling the story. Just go pick up The Alchemist's Touch. It's available on iTunes right now, and it'll be out on Audible in a matter of days. Okay. Now it's time for today's episode. Today, you're getting Chapter 24 of Nightblade, as Lauren, Jim, and Annis sneak through the sewers in the city of Cabras. Enjoy! Nightblade, Chapter 24 Annis remained so anxious that Lauren feared the girl might shriek again and bring Gregor running at any moment. But the girl merely clung to Lauren's arm, silent other than an occasional whimper. "'Why do you snivel so?' said Jem. "'There is nothing to fear here, unless you are one of those children who dreads rats.' "'I do not,' snapped Annis. Lauren was glad at least to hear some spark in her tone. "'Only I do not enjoy dark places, nor ones that keep me from the sky and open air.' They passed another hole leading above, and in its blue glow, Jem eyed Lauren. "'Where did you find this one? She whimpers like a frightened pup.' "'I told you,' Lauren muttered. "'She—' "'You told me you were kin.' Jem eyed Annis's dark skin and Lauren's pale face. "'I see that you take me for a fool, which is your folly. I have told you I might have been a scholar, and even a simpleton could see your claim is false.' "'It is a distant relation,' Lauren said, keenly aware how poor her excuse sounded. Jem scoffed and said nothing. To cover the awkward silence that followed, Lauren turned back to Annis. "'How have you fared since we parted? What did you do after you fled?' "'Mostly just that. I fled. First I rode heedless through the streets. Thank the sky that our friends, the constables, rode no horses.' Once I had well quit them, I abandoned my steed and sought out dark alleyways to hide in. There I wandered for many hours, unsure what to do, until I determined to abandon my finery for these garments you see. She raised her arms, drawing wide the patchwork cloak draped over her shoulders. I found a clothier who kept many such peasants' garments in his stores. He traded for my dress and some coin. Did you meet a woman named Auntie? said Lauren. Annis only looked at her expression blank. She is young, only a few years older than I, and a mage. She had skin like potter's clay, but her hair glowed like wheat stalks in summer sun. That will not help, said Jem. She might have looked like anything. Lauren blinked. He was right, of course. I met no one like any of that. I met no one at all. I sought only to hide and to keep my face from being seen. Why would I seek anyone out? Somehow they caught wind of you said Lauren. Auntie and her children told Gregor where to find you. The clothier, said Jem. I would wager he is one of Auntie's eyes. She has many such throughout the city, those she can count upon for a quick favor or a word of truth in her ear. Lauren gave a small growl of frustration. Then how may we evade her? The longer you remain, the slimmer your chances, said Jem with a shrug. We must take passage or she will kill us for certain. "'Kill us!' said Annis. Jem stopped dead in the tunnel and turned to look at them, bathed in a halo of moon's light. "'Of course kill us. Do you think Auntie plays at some silly game? You, Lauren, have now twice defied her, and you, O pretty merchant's daughter, may hope for some leniency, but like as not, you will find none. 
Auntie knows a thousand dark holes just the right size for a body, and from which no one will ever recover you. He pointed at a rivulet of waste that ran by their feet. But I, I have done nothing to her, said Annis. Why would she seek to harm me? Jem looked uneasily around. Understand, Auntie seeks always for situations to improve our station. Anything that may gain her a few more coins for the children or a week's leniency from the constables. But when she does not get her way, she angers swiftly. Lauren thought she saw him hide a shudder. Annis clutched at Lauren's arm, her terrified eyes sunken and hollow. We must leave this cursed place, quickly. We are beset on all sides, Lauren, and buried beneath the earth as well. I cannot take this dark coffin a moment longer. I cannot. Annis broke off, breathing so heavily that the air wheezed in her throat. The girl's legs buckled and pitched her to the stone, nearly throwing her into the stream of sewage. Lauren grabbed her at the last moment and propped her up against the wall. Annis, she cried. What is it? What is wrong? Hold, said Jem, pushing Lauren aside. He grasped the back of Annis's neck and thrust her head towards the ground. What are you doing? said Lauren, trying to push him away. But Jem held her off with an outstretched arm and gave her a look of such calm certainty that Lauren felt herself paralyzed. Quickly the boy hooked a hand under Annis's knees, drawing them up to hold on either side of her head. He forced her head still farther down, and as he held her there, Lauren heard the girl's breath grow easier. Within a moment she slumped back against the wall, shaking, tears in her eyes, but calm again. "'Some children get the terrors when they first come to Auntie,' explained Jem. "'This is how we help them. I learned it early on. They say I could have been a medica, you know.' "'They say you could have been many things,' said Lauren wryly. "'But thank you.' She scooted forwards on her knees, placing a soothing hand on the girl's shoulder. Annis, are you well enough to go on? Annis looked up at her, blinking away her tears. I do not want to go on. I want to get out. Jem grunted. As well you should. We must move quickly, for I fear Auntie's children may soon draw near, if they have not already. They are never as plentiful in the sewer as they are upon the rooftops, but these passages are not unknown to them. Together they helped Annis on her feet, and now Lauren kept a steady hand on the younger girl's back, ready to support her. Jem pressed their pace hard, and before long he paused beneath another hole cut into the street. Lauren knew not why this drainage differed from any other they had passed, but Jem pointed up with certainty. Lauren boosted him up first, for he was lightest. Once he peered around and waved them up, she seized Annis around her thighs, lifting her up and stretching as high as she could. Lauren felt a moment's strange gratitude to her father. Whatever he had given her in the way of bruises and beatings, she also owed him her height. Jem seized Annis's wrists and dragged her up into the moonlight. With a small hop, Lauren gripped the edges of the drainage, and a moment later she found herself under stars once again. She could see nothing familiar. Jem set off down the alleyway, and Lauren followed quickly. Annis's shoulders still shook slightly beneath Lauren's hand, but the girl's relief at leaving the catacombs was almost palpable. "'The elf's purse lies only a few more buildings away,' said Jem. "'Soon we will be safe and—' He stopped short, leaping back to push them all against the wall. "'Curse everything,' he snapped. "'The place is watched.' "'Watched?' said Lauren. By whom? Auntie's children, said Jem, his voice low and ominous. See for yourself. Lauren peeked around the corner, looking down the alley towards the inn's back door. I see nothing, she whispered. Look at the roofs, said Jem, and watch for the glint of eyes in shadow. Lauren looked again. There, Atop the roof of the building facing the purse she saw the small mound of a child's head, and in one corner where lurked a beggar, his head cradled in his hands, she caught the flash of moon's light on two orbs, the large eyes of a child. She ducked back out of sight. How? How could they know of Zane? And what would they want with him in any case? 
I do not think they seek the wizard, said Jem. I believe they seek us. Some within the tavern saw us. One must have passed word to Auntie, and she sent her children to watch. She will never come for us in plain sight, but waits for us to leave and kill us in the shadows. How will we find our way back inside? said Lauren. We must warn Zane. He is our only chance of leaving the city. If they watch the back door, the front will be doubly guarded. That leaves only a window. Jem pointed up. Lauren looked. In the second and third stories were windows like the one in Zane's room. It seemed an easy enough climb, but she glanced at Annis beside her. Annis looked back at her, uncomprehending. What? How are you as a climber? Annis glanced up at the window, and her eyes widened in shock. She looked back at Lauren. Surely you jest. Lauren sighed. Wait here, then. Jem, you stay with her. What will you do? said the boy. Leave that to me. The inn had rough walls, with many chunks of plaster having been torn free over the years. Not too high up, the plaster gave way to great wooden crossbars. Lauren found a good place for her climb a few paces down the building's length. She looked up and down the alley for any observer, but saw only beggars lying oblivious. Hand over foot, she scaled the wall until her fingers found the lip of a wooden beam. But just as she began to pull herself up, plaster gave way beneath her right toe. Lauren nearly pitched into the street, only saving herself by the skin of her fingertips. She winced as splinters dug into her flesh. "'Be careful!' said Jem. "'Be silent,' growled Lauren. She tried again, and this time managed to gain purchase on a windowsill. Cautiously, she poked an eye above the ledge to look within the room. She ducked down immediately, crimson rushing to her cheeks. The man and woman in that room would not take kindly to intrusion. Struggling to put the image from her mind, she sidled along the side of the building towards the next room, holding the bottom of the sill above her and walking atop the window frames below. A wide gap of wall stretched to the next window, nearly five feet in length. Again, thankful for her height, Lauren stretched until she could just grab the sill before sidling along below the window. This room lay empty. She pulled herself up, gripping the top of the window's frame as she stood on the bottom of it. Lauren tried prying her fingers into the frame to pull the window open, but without success. She relented for a moment, reinforcing her grip on the window sill as she studied the glass. There. A lock at the top of the window held it shut. Lauren dug for her dagger and drew it. The metal glinted strangely in the moonlight, throwing rays of blue into her eyes. She stared at it in wonder for a moment before coming to her senses. Slowly she slid into a half-crouch. With one swift movement, she brought the pommel stone crashing against a single pane. Glass tinkled to the floor, too loud for her comfort. She snaked a hand in, careful not to cut herself on the shards, and tripped the latch. As soon as she did, the bottom of the window swung outward and struck her hip. Almost she pitched out into empty space, but her hands lashed out and clung to the sill. Lauren yanked herself to the building, clutching its side for a moment while she fought to catch her breath and still her racing heart. "'Are you all right?' came Jem's harsh whisper from below. Lauren looked down and nodded, and then placed a finger to her lips. In another moment she had slid into the room, where she went quickly to the bed. A blanket and sheet lay upon it, with another blanket folded on a table. Lauren tied them into a line, thrice testing the knots to ensure their strength. She returned to the window and threw her impromptu rope into the darkness. For security, she tied her end around one of the bed's legs before she leaned out. All right, she whispered. Come up, Annis. Annis placed one hand on the blanket and then another. She pulled, but her arms trembled and she slumped back to her feet. I am not a climber. Lauren sighed. She had feared this. All right, then. Do your best to hold on, will you? Lauren braced her feet against the wall and wrapped both hands firmly around the blanket. Checking her grip again, she pulled as hard as she could. Hand over hand she tugged, and the blanket slid up the wall with aching slowness. A tense while passed before Annis's hands appeared at the windowsill and gripped it. 
Lauren leaned out and hauled the girl in over the window frame where she collapsed, shaking on the floor. Lauren threw the rope of blankets back down, but before she could even think of hauling it up once more, Jem scrambled up and into the room. He landed lightly on the balls of his feet, glancing down at Annis with disdain. See? he said. Not so hard, is it? Annis glared up at him, but said nothing. This has been a production of Legacy Books, written and narrated by Garrett Robinson. The music in this podcast was created by Will Musser. Check out his incredible work at willmusser.com. That's W-I-L-L-M-U-S-S-E-R dot com. Today's letter is V. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.